Hi everyone, I'm Ivo Lettercast, also known on YouTube as JB Speaks, and this is my Grimdark Book Club, where I discuss and review a new Grimdark book on the second Friday of each month. For those of you unfamiliar with the Grimdark genre, it's a genre of fiction characterized by disturbing, violent, or bleak subject matter in a dystopian setting. It was popularized by the Warhammer community and has been gaining a lot of traction over the past 15 years. Especially of late, we've seen a lot of shows, graphic novels, written novels, and movies coming out that could easily fit into the Grimdark subgenre of speculative fiction, and my stories definitely count. Speaking of, who else is excited about the new Warhammer PC game coming out, Battle Sector, and the new animated show Angels of Death? I know I am. Speaking of animation, I apologize for not being visible in person today for those of you watching this on YouTube. I am currently both looking and feeling like garbage, so instead, I'm putting this audio over some cut footage from my latest Build With Me video, which should be publishing very soon. So let's get to it. We're on episode two right now. Last episode, which was the very first episode, um, we left off after a very, very long, but also very truncated synopsis of the first three books of the Horus Heresy, which are Horus Rising by Dan Abnett, False Gods by Graham McNeil, and Galaxy in Flames by Ben Counter. Without going into too much detail, and if you want that detail, go ahead and click off to episode one of the Grimdark Book Club, the first three books of the Horus Heresy introduce us to the world and characters of 40k, even though it's not officially the 41st millennium yet, um, and clue us in on what exactly happened that caused the disastrous, chaotic, grim, dark state that the galaxy embodies in the 41st millennium. So it's basically like the very well-written and very layered tale of Horus's misguided descent into pure chaos. Now, if you don't know who I'm talking about when I say Horus, or what I'm talking about when I say Horus Heresy, or the 41st Millennium, please watch the first episode, because <laughs> uh, you kind of need it for any of this to make sense. Also, this is the point where I'm going to tell you that there are spoilers ahead. If you don't want them, click away from this video now. So, right. Character commentary. So my favorite character in the first three books of the Horus Heresy... Um, well, obviously, the main character here is Garviel Loken, and while I don't typically like the hero types, the the main characters, um, I actually really liked the way he was written, so yeah, actually, he is my favorite in this part of the series. Um, I was initially actually going to say uh, Garrow, Nathaniel Garrow, but we don't really know him well enough yet uh, in this part of the series to really appreciate his character. He doesn't really officially come into play until the fourth book in the Horus Heresy series, which is Flight of the Eisenstein. You will hear me talk about it all the time. It's my favorite Horus Heresy book, I think. I think. I don't know. I'm quite a few books in, so that might, that opinion might have changed, but I tend to say, yes, that is my favorite. Um, so my least favorite character will always be Angron, like always. I'm sorry if he's, like, your favorite Primarch. Um, anything with him in it makes me feel, like, vastly uncomfortable. Um, and it's it's really just because he reminds me of my biological dad. Like, he just makes me super uncomfortable. Um, but that's what's awesome about that character, too, is even though I don't like him, I like him as a plot tool. I like that he embodies certain aspects of Warhammer that are, like, really crucial to that universe. Um, so even for characters that I don't like, uh, at least in this series, in this universe, um, I still appreciate them all for existing in the story because they're useful, like super useful in telling the tale of, of what's going on. Um, okay, so my thoughts on the legions slash chapters involved. Um... I understand why they didn't go into, like, having the Death Guard and the Emperor's Children, like, in further detail in these books, even though I would have really liked to know more about them. Um, and I did actually like the tone they set for how the Luna Wolves and slash Sons of Horus culture looked. Um, as I've read further, it's been really cool to see the different manifestations and cultures that exist uh, within each Primarch's, like, gene seed, basically. So that's been really cool. 
Um, but to be honest, I was a little shocked at how intimate the relationships were between the Sons of Horus, like the Battle Brothers dynamic. Um, I, it seemed to me like the author wasn't quite sure if they were meant to be romantically involved or not. Now, that could have just been the way that the writers wrote them or the way that they were... Like, it could really actually just be, like, that's their culture. Like, they're just deeply intimate and very emotionally close with each other. Um, it didn't take away from the story for me at all. Um, but it did actually add a unique inflection to that Legion in particular, especially in terms of how the Mournival interacted with each other. And it, it kind of made them seem and feel to me like... I mean, they're called the Sons of Horus, right? And and it really did make them seem to me almost like children in their sort of, like, naive, trusting, uh, very sweet bond with each other and their Primarch, um, especially in terms of, obviously, the main character, Logan. Um, and, I mean, on that note, th my thoughts on the character development are... I really love books that take characters and challenge their beliefs and their realities, and that is exactly what these books did. It was, like, a very long-winded way to go about it, but it has to be when you're looking at um, Astartes. Um, but, yeah, the characters we met at the beginning were either not alive by the end or very much not who they were at the start. Or maybe they were, like, even, like, a more refined version of who they were at the start, and I liked that a lot. I really did. So in terms of plot commentary, my favorite part of the entire series was really just seeing how each piece of the series fit together, and they left, like, Easter eggs almost for us to, to rediscover later on as we read further into the series. Um, so I really like to get to know the characters, too. I enjoyed watching some of them make it out alive, and I enjoyed um, knowing that others got caught in the fray. Um, there's a, like a sense of poetic justice when you kill off characters, especially when it's one that maybe the readers are attached to or that the readers might have felt were safe. Uh, and that's what's awesome about the grimdark genre is, is nobody really is safe, right? Um, so my favorite scene in the entire trilogy, um, I actually have quite a few, but basically anything with super compelling imagery, I re actually remember reading when Horus was fighting the warp beast that had been Temba on Davin and actually having to stop and, like, take some deep breaths because I felt like I could smell and uh, feel just the the pestilence and the just grossness of it all. It was so expertly written. And then, of course, just watching over time, the, the slow destruction of the Mornival scene by scene, just them starting to sort of come together and then fall apart, and the the skillful depiction of the different ways that chaos manifested, like, throughout all three books. Needless to say, I'm a fan of prose. If what you write makes me feel something, either emotionally or, um, I would say viscerally, if that is the correct word, or even, um, like I mentioned, like, like sensations. <laughs> um, that's, that is what I want out of a book. And that's what I want to give my readers as well. So like, obviously like, my feelings about the book, we already kind of covered a little bit here and on the last episode, which is really just the first half of this episode. It's, it's cut into two pieces because it was too long, but essentially I felt like the first book was dry but necessary. Um, and the second and third books really kicked the action and imagery into high gear in a way that made me not want to put them down. So, um, but the drawbacks really were incredibly obvious, <laughs> at least to me as a person who was assigned female at birth and who is transgender. Um, women are not written very well in this universe. It does get better later on, but especially in the first few books, the perspectives of the people in this universe really reflect a time where women were considered fairer, weaker sex, um, and the books are written with a voice and intonation that accentuates that. 
Now, whether it's the writer's own preconceived notions or the way they were encouraged to write femme-presenting characters is something we might never actually know, but I will say that did interrupt my enjoyment of the stories, and that can that is a continuing theme. And I could choose to either view it as, like, this is just how it is, or I can choose to view it, which I do now, as a commentary on sort of the lack of that uh, feminine influence on the way that things are and and that as being part of why things are spiraling out of control so hard is because there are people whose potential are just not being used to benefit society. So the most exciting part to me about reading these three books, and I think I speak for a lot of people when I say this, um, it's awesome to get to know the intimate details of just exactly how fucked up this universe is. Like, the first three books are a great introduction to that because it starts out seeming, like, reasonable, like, ah, this is, like, militaristic space adventures, exciting, but it very quickly descends into madness and, like, literal chaos. Um, I'm now working on A Thousand Suns by Graham McNeil, reading, not writing, obviously. Um, It's exquisitely done. (laughs) Like, it's so well done. I know I keep saying exquisite. That's just the word on my tongue today. Um, But I think a lot of people are really going to enjoy the different ways that Horus and Magnus interact with the warp and the beings therein, as well as the comparison between the visions each of them receive as a product of that. Now, in terms of pacing, I think the first three books are actually really well paced. My disclaimer, again, is always going to be (laughs) that the first book just takes ages to get through, Um, but it is crucial stuff. It is vital foundational information you need in order to enjoy the rest of the series. 100% worth the read. Did I enjoy the ending slash big idea? I absolutely loved the ending of this trilogy. Oh my god, it was gorgeous. The way they ended with the characters, the way they left us off, like, just sort of like, on a cliffhanger with a hint of finality, but not enough for it to truly be the end, that was skillful writing. Um, And it's the reason I'm still reading the books today. I started reading The Horus Heresy in January of 2020. So that kind of gives you an idea. Would I read the books or authors again? I will absolutely be rereading the second and third books in this trilogy. Also, all three of these writers do continue to write for uh, Black Library, Uh, for, I think each of them gets at least one more book that they've written in the series. So I do and have read more. I have to say, Graham McNeil is just, like, hitting the ball out of the park on A Thousand Suns, so I highly recommend, like, getting to that point. There are a few books in between that are a little bit like, do I have to read this? But the answer is yes. Yes, you have to. Was the book immersive? I felt supremely immersed by the end of the second book. Um, and all throughout the entire third. The first book, as I've said like too many times in this episode, it just took a lot. It took a lot to finish. It took me like three months to finish that book. Um, Was it easier or hard to read? I would say this trilogy requires some focus to read, and if you're not a fan of militaristic science fiction or grimdark themes, the entire series is just not for you. Um, But if you are a fan, I would say that with a few exceptions, this is this is a really, really, really enjoyable series to read. Would I recommend it and to whom? Um, I recommend anyone who wants to get into Warhammer 40k and is interested in the lore starts right here with book one. Um, it was my introduction to the fandom. I wouldn't have it any other way. Starting with book one and committing to finish the first three books is what really led me to get into Warhammer, but it also, as a writer, it was like a light bulb flicked on for me because I've written, turns out, I've written grimdark type content since I could pick up a pen. Like, as soon as I could start writing, I was writing stories, and the stories were all grimdark. They were all they would all fit into speculative fiction. Some of them are science-y, some of them are steampunk, but all of them have a similar theme of just, I wouldn't say depressing, but depressing. <laughs> and I've been told that by people who've been like, ah, yes, I'll read your stuff. And they get halfway through and they're like, dude, 
this is too grim. Like, this is too dark. I can't finish it. And so for the longest time, I really did not feel like there was a an audience for the type of stuff that I like to write, but it turns out that, like, there is a whole subgenre dedicated to what I write. So if you read Grimdark or if you write content and you're like, man, I don't know if there's anybody out there going to read this, I really strongly suggest starting on, on the Horus Heresy because for me, that was what helped me get back into, yes, people are going to want to read my stuff because I write so people will read it. I don't just write to get a story out, although sometimes that's necessary for some of us, but um, I, I want people to read my stuff. I want them to enjoy it. I want to make people feel something with my words. I want them to, like, you know, be immersed in these worlds that I build and, you know, befriend and fall in love with these characters that I bring to life. And I wasn't, I felt like I wasn't going to ever be able to do that until I read this series. So that's my perspective. Um, that's it. <laughs> the second part of this episode, uh, we're calling it episode two officially, is a lot shorter than the first part because the first part I had to summate an entire trilogy. <laughs> and I don't know why I thought that was a great idea, but I did it anyway. Um, so it, that's it. If you enjoyed my re review, um, you might enjoy my writing too. It will be available on Amazon Vela for free for your grim entertainment starting around August 2021, obviously depending on whenever Amazon Vela officially like becomes unveiled. Um, I also will be publishing my Arachnapocalypse Omnibus at the end of the year, which will contain um, at least four stories in it, as well as some maps and diagrams, potentially more content than that, depending on really just how much time I have and how much energy I have to put into it. But yeah, you can find more information for like all of that and so much more. Like I write a lot more than just Arachnapocalypse. I've got uh, a couple of speculative fiction novels in the works, as well as some steampunk short stories, and a poetry book. Anyway, you can learn about all of that at my website, ilettercast.com. That's spelled I-L-E-T-T-E-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you tune in to my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash J-B Speaks, I release a new video every Friday on that YouTube channel, um, and then of course the last Friday of every month is when I actually do a live stream to announce the winner of the free book for that month. So be sure to subscribe, obviously hit the notification bell if you want, no pressure, um, and get notified when I release new content. I obviously, at the beginning of every month, do my Indie Author Connection interview. And then on the second Friday of every month, I actually have a Grimdark book club podcast that I do. The third Friday of every month is a little bit of a free-for-all. I kind of just put something up. It might be talking about my personal life, talking about a new upcoming story I'm working on. Um, kind of just a wide range of topics. I occasionally do a paint with me or build with me for mini models, specifically to do with Warhammer. So I really try to make sure that there's a little bit of content for everyone on my channel, and I would super duper appreciate your subscription. My subscription goal for the end of this month is 3,000 subscribers. It doesn't sound like a lot in comparison to everyone else, but we've been hovering at 2,600 for about three months now, and I want to break that plateau. So if you wouldn't mind being one of my brand new subscribers, if you could just hit that button down below, I would really appreciate it. All right, that's everything for me, so I will see you slash speak to you next Friday. Remember to be kind to yourself and others.